welcome uh, to the after Thursday afternoon session of Taking a Look on Public. And um, we have a number of interesting presentations, um, beginning with the first one, which I'll turn it over in just a minute. Uh, this afternoon, we're talking about two books on Tom Lacan. And that being said, let me introduce Matthias. OK. So uh, Matthias Lage is one of our faculty members at the Clinical College of Colorado. Uh, he's an analyst in Buenos Aires, has an institutional practice in a hospital, and also has been teaching in university for many years, and is a very dear friend who happens to have a certain pet a.k.a. passion with poetry. So much so, he's about to marry a poet. So, um, <laughs> in that being said, I'm just going to hand it over to him so we can be somewhat enlightened and see what happens. Thanks a lot, Gabby. You're welcome again. Um, same to you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm glad to be here. I think the meetings have been really nice. And I hope we can still work a bit more. So, it's about poetry in psychoanalysis. I think that the best name for it would be a sort of a friendship between poetry and psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis has been walking along with poetry. You can find um, references to poets in Freud's interpretation of dreams that we could count that book as the kickstarter of psychoanalysis because it um, gives back the responsibility to perhaps the subject, at least the, to the talking being or speaking being. Perhaps talking being after the, the talking cure. <coughs> there, are, there are many who have said that poetry and the human condition are intimately related. Either is one, since we are in a philosophy house. Either with his idea that poets are sorts of guardians of a certain language and also within the French, Deleuze and Badiou, I think those are names you know, they give a special place to poetry. And following Freud, perhaps poetry is not the best name for it, in a way. Freud work, worked with Dichtung, which is like a literary, poetic, dramatic creation. All that is contained there, it's spelled Dichtung. <laughs> He had different uses of what we could say his poets. One thing that I think it's remarkable is that Freud used uh, ancient poets like Sophocles, his Oedipus name. So poetry is all over, if you are willing to, to see it. But not only, also contemporary ones, or pretty much contemporary, like Hoffman, E.T.A. Hoffman, the writer of Sandman, which is the, the base of the article of the Uncanny, is based on that reading. <coughs> Schreber, President Mr. Schreber. Are you familiar with that name? Right. 
which is in a way, I think, like in the border of a poetic creation. It's not art, perhaps it is. We are not so certain. And when we have to deal with Trevor, we only have questions. So Freud used poets as case studies, which I think is not the most useful way, the most useful use of poetry in psychoanalysis. It's not using characters as case studies or study cases, I don't know which is the proper name, study, study cases. He also used the saying of, of poets or dichter or his dichtung to prove theories. As characters, you can find that in, I don't know the proper translation in English, but the, some traits of character distinguished by psychoanalysis. And when he talks about those who fail when they succeed, he talks about Lady Macbeth. There are more examples. This is just one. And when, for instance, with, with the case of Hoffman, which is one I like, he's not psychoanalyzing characters. He's trying to transmit, to demonstrate something. And that's the use I like the most. And that's what I could find in Lacan. The reference that you can find in Lacan in poetry or literary creations or dramatic creations, which I think were his favorites in the sense that it was from dramatic place that he could get the biggest outcome, but not the only one. For instance, if you take uh, his, his two readings, one in, in his early teachings and one in his later teachings about the, the purloined letter, because it's actually written in English, uh, by Pope. His analysis is not about, I don't know, the, the psyches of Dupin, the inspector. It's totally different. It's about what are the coordinates that Lacan could find regarding um, some bits of the symbolic as he conceives it. I will not get into it, I will get into something else. Which is one of, I think, Lacan um, best findings, which is what he did when he read Hamlet in his seminar, which has been recently published, number six, Le Désir et la is some interpretation, desire and its interpretation. This is from 58, 59, if I'm not wrong. Yep, 58, 59. And it's the previous seminar that you've been working with Carl. The Carl, I think, or, no, with Carl. It's the previous seminar than the one they're working with Carl currently. Exactly, with Carl currently, which is the ethics. And here, Lacan uses seven lessons to read Hamlet by William Shakespeare in order to learn something about desire, precisely. On this idea, I will read something that you can find in I think, the first class he devotes to Hamlet. The poetic creations engender, they create, rather than reflect 
psychological creations. This is, this is a very important, I think, uh, difference regarding what might put said to be those type of approaches where you have like predetermined personality character <laughs> images of personalities that are with humans since I don't know, the very beginning. To Lacan, the, um, the forms of the human conditions are invented. And poetry, literary creators, establish I'll read a bit more. Even though the dream of Shakespeare might be behind Hamlet, this is secondary. In the light of what composes the structure. Is this a structure that responds to the effect of Hamlet. So, the method, the method that Lacan is um, teaching is not using the work of art to understand the author, and these are all categories that during the 20th century have been deeply questioned. Perhaps it is different if it is a running case as the meeting, our earlier meeting. But when we approach the work of art, there is nothing behind it. And when we, as the same as when we approach or when we listen to the saying of a patient, perhaps the, a thought or a writing, there is nothing behind it, or nothing is behind it, if you like. We don't read poets, we can, but I wouldn't recommend it to read poets, to understand that strange form of the human condition that we call the psyches. Not even the psyche that we can assume that the characters have or are. We use poetry to think in a clinical direction. Perhaps some of you can use it to think philosophically. Yep. When you say there's nothing behind it, do you mean there's nothing behind the listening, or there's nothing behind what you listen to? Mm, what would be the difference between listening and what you listen to? Yeah. That's an interesting question. But, mm -hmm. I, I would say that um, the um, we try not to work with the notion of origin. Of origin. Put forward that idea last night. We have to drop that if we want to. It's a morning, in the sense that it is a process to let it go. We can work with the notion of cause, rather as an something that, well, as Carl was saying last night, not as a presence, but perhaps as lack. Lack with A, in the sense of it causes something that is missing, but that has effects. And we don't work with pre established uh, theology with effects. So, text, the text can have effects, but it doesn't mean that but those come after. The archaeology image that is deeply promoted in <coughs> Freud's 
works are a huge obstacle to contemporary psychoanalysis. Oh, contemporary psychoanalysis does not mean like close in America under that number. Under the, that number, sorry. There is a name on, of that? Yes, but there is a whole another writing class. It's not what you are calling it. So, why don't you explain what you're saying with contemporary? So, All right. Thanks. Contemporary. I like what Agamben's. You know Agamben, the Italian guy? Yeah. yeah. Genealogist. He's, he does <coughs> what I'm trying to do now, a genealogy. You know, like, I don't know if you could pronounce Genealogy. genealogy. Exactly. Like uh, finding the traces, and um, many times that it is what uh, publishing is about genealogy. I expect more from philosophers, uh, psychoanalysts, from the human condition. I expect uh, inventions. I don't think there is nothing new under the sun. And. Contemporary, for example, means the, those who can, he has a text, what is a contemporary? I don't know if you're familiar with that text, but there he says that he uses also a poem, a poem about a century, I think it's a, from Milos, if I'm not wrong, where he says that the century has uh, its backbone broken. And his reading is that that is where the poet places him or herself in the breakage of his own time. In the, he says, in, in the shapes, not in the lights. Not breaking the time, but he occupies the space where the century, his century, or her century, is broken. And this is um, the subject. But not as a, something that would fulfill or reconcile. I have this enigma here for you. <laughs> it's a poem not as something that could fulfill that, that gap. So contemporary, um, not only in the sense of ongoing, when you, when you place your bet on what is um, inconsistent. We need that inconsistency. And if the truth, the truth is already there under something, and we are like archaeologists doing that, I think the whole, it's, perhaps it can be a bit misleading. I will read a bit more of what I could find here. Bueno, dale. Hamlet is not a clinical case. And To I think that the concept the concept that we could use here is the concept of uh, loss or lack lack perhaps I think Herman you will talk about that later and of what is multiple of multiple of um, Perhaps the void, what the play can tell us about desire and about the human condition. We know, for instance, um, 
and you were talking about that thing in a way, what we can say in our own vocabulary that what has no representation. Since Freud, we know that death and multiplicity. That is what I've come to bring. And what I've taken is that I have to give proof of my own ideas and I receive the freshness of your questions and your enthusiasm. In Hamlet, we have a, a play where there, are, there is a testimony of sexuality in Hamlet's mother. You read Hamlet. You know that, that, that lady, the widow, short widow. That, that famous phrase, you know that she became a widow and she married the brother of her former husband, if I'm not wrong. And to embrace when something that you may read or listen to or want to do or write in that sense is heterogeneous, multiple. And to invite you to think in a in a way that there is no guarantee, there is nothing behind to provide consistency to the human condition. But that doesn't make it worthless, because that breakage, that gap, can become a cause for desire. As Gabriel Lombardi, which he, he was in, in, I think, this building talking, was here or in the forum? Uh, no, not in this building, no. All right. He's at the church, it's the FDA. All right. Yeah. He's a professor in Buenos Aires. He talks about liberty in psychoanalysis, Lombardi. And he says something that I read recently and that I like. The fact that we are, that we have an end, in the sense that a limit, we are touched by death, makes us pathetic but precious creatures. And a way, one way to occupy that breakage, that gap, can produce the effect that we call desire. Any more questions? One more question we, we have to... Um, you used <coughs> imminence, multiplicity, and gap yep. in defining this space. And so that just, for me, elicited um, consideration of other thinkers. When you say those things, is, is it helpful or detrimental to think of Deleuze and of Lacan's use of the gap? Is that precisely what we're talking about? Yeah. Uh, philosophically, perhaps, more than psychoanalytically, but we are all concerned about human condition and thought. I think. And um, in Spinoza, it's really difficult to find a way of thinking desire, especially now. A sort of a song. Let the snake wait under his weed, and the writing be of words, slow and sharp to strike, quiet to wait, sleepless, through metaphor to reconcile the people and the stones. Compose, no ideas but in things, invent, the sexy frame. Sorry, I forgot the sleepless. Is my flower that splits the rocks. Sleepless, <laughs> as dear A, the case of Gabby presented. What is this about? Any guesses? My own reading, but. 
I would like to hear yours. Opened up for it's not so afraid to mean stone breaker. Exactly. We see this in the last two lines of the, or maybe that's one line that broke on the, on the board, but um, we can refer back to the, the reconciliation of people and stones. It's this idea of ideas and things mm -hmm. that maybe can affect this reconciliation, or maybe because it's a split, so. It's a split that brings together. I don't. I mean, I don't know. Like, sort of dialectical in that. Exactly in that regard. I think that it's. Um, uh, well, thanks for the comment. I really enjoy the way you kept the problem that the poem is proposing. I think that this uh, composing or connecting, but also breaking, is part of our task. Is a problem, uh, as the Russians, the Russian formalists would say, it is a, a shifting meaning in the verse. It has movement. It's like a, a machine. In that sense, and reconcile that. We don't need to fix it to um, dissolve that tension. <laughs> Produces um, work. Let the snake wait under his wit and the writing be of words, slow and quick, sharp to strike, quiet to wait, sleepless. And the original poem has this dash or hyphen or, or M, M dash. M dash, yeah. I would try to do a double M dash. What I read there is that the, that is a different voice. The poem has a dialogue. Let the snake wait under his width, and the writing be of words, slow and quick, sharp to strike, quiet to wait. Sleepless. The analytical interpretation, the way we read, is really hard to differentiate from writing. We produce signifiers. Signifiers are not there at the beginning. It's not archaeology. You can think of the unconscious more as a machine than as a thing <coughs> that you have to dig and find something. It's producing. Meaning, signifiers, that really strange meaning that the unconscious can produce. Or to be more precise, it are the formations of the unconscious that produce the meaning. In an apricot, in a retroactive way. So, the writing, which is the reading, let that be a word. Slow and quick, sharp to strike, quiet to wait, sleepless. This could be perfectly part of the advice to physicians that Freud wrote. And then, a different voice. Through metaphor to reconcile the people and the stones. The, the metaphor has been taken as the paradigm or as a paradigmatic image of reading. In a way. The, which is reconciling dissolving, joining, but as producing meaning and sense. It 
to reconcile the people and the stones. In order to have that reconciliation, we need to have different substances, different essence. The essence of the people and the essence of the stones. This is far away from our ethics, especially after Spinoza. And then, perhaps the voice of the beginning, or a new different voice, pose. No ideas, but in things, invent. No ideas, but in things. This is a famous slogan. I think that uh, the, as the list says, we have concepts because we have problems. Time moves, we have new problems, <coughs> and your task, if you're willing to accept it, is to produce new concepts. Compose. How can we produce a link? How can we occupy space, a breakage, without a metaphor, without a solution, without trying to produce a unity? We have to invent something. I think that is shown in the case of Gabi that she presented a few years ago where the, these talking beans show that they are totally out of the standard and they force us as analysts, as readers, as writers to produce a non-standard reading and writing or a non-standard way of holding that <coughs> non-standard testimony. <coughs> Compose. How to think in a supplementary way, not complementary. Things add up. This is something that a psychoanalyst finds when he's dealing in his practice or her practice and the discourse goes to symptom, memory, identifications, and you are playing in different tables all at once. And how to work with this, I would say, multiplicity. Multiple and different sorts of things concepts of ideas. Certainly, and Freud told us this, the task of the analyst is to analyze, perhaps to support the analysis that is going on there in this common place, strange place, where <clears throat> Is not easily is not easy from the analysis what is from the analyst what is in the poem of William Carlos Williams what belongs to my reading to what you are receiving but that will be asking which is the origin of this I prefer to think of what are the effects Have you ever seen a saxifrage? It grows in the rocks. It's amazing. Its place is the very breakage. But the saxifrage can produce the breakage. I think that perhaps we can make the breakage. Well, I will leave some time for questions or comments or remarks or anything. So, yep. Um, so like, 
this are you saying the poem is a like a maybe a combination of like when you were talking about the contemporary breaks and the space inhabit is it as a symptom of this or a solution? Uh, it depends on what you understand by symptom, but I think that poems can tell you something about it. they are a symptom. Mm, so far as I'm concerned, symptoms, analytical symptoms, can only be produced in analysis. And they are what, as Lacan says, what, it, what is, what is analyzed. Analyze, analyze all. Mm, I wouldn't say a symptom in the sense of a metaphor of our times. It's not, it's, it's not something that it is in a different level of where we are. It's a friend of mine. It's not in a different level. And I could, I couldn't have said this without Spinoza. The poem is with us. Another one of your friends. He's another of my friends, yeah. <laughs> it's um, I remember once that you told me something like this. Okay. Uh, that I talk about when we were doing something, and I would ask, uh, "What is the meaning of this?" For example, what uh, is it? What if we have a picture? What could this have? What could this have meant? What could William Carlos William have meant? What he said, uh, for example, on this. No, and he told me something like the author is dead, not in the sense that he's really dead, but in the sense that, okay, and once he writes the, the poem, the novel, he makes the song, if he's a singer or whatever, then he's uh, a reader just like us. So the author is dead in that sense. on the effects. Um, I don't need to be effective ones that I have found. The, yeah. Are you going to go along with an no. idea? Or may I? No, it's okay. okay. I was um, caught by surprise by many things that just actually even after talking to you earlier sort of like um, striking me differently in, in many ways. So I'm, uh, I'm glad about this. I like the fact. Um, this that you were saying earlier, when we approach the work of art, nothing is behind it. Uh, I cannot help but something about abstinence. About? Abstinence. Hmm. Um, also, when you said poetry is not to be understood, in the sense that neither is an anonymous mm. um, The thing that, well, the way that you were describing of the use that Lacan makes of poetry as a, a 
device of sorts, this positive, I don't know how to say it in English, this word to say this positive in English. Uh, yeah, but apparatus sounds more like, a, well, it's more like a machine, and that's not the problem that it can, but perhaps the matter would be a uh, it's a very interesting idea. Um, I'm looking for the bigger pieces. Um, and on the other end, the other thing that I couldn't help but thinking is when you spoke of this turning back, what did you call it? La, la plaque tournant. Le, well, well, yeah, like a spinning plate. Like a spinning plate. Uh, and the traitors of desire and uh, here, there, the figure of the passer, the the one that receives the dharma. I mean, if you put it a little in a bit of context, the passer is what we spoke very very finely last night. Is something where somebody wants to say, basically, I'm going to say it very very simply. Somebody wants to say about the effects of their own analysis. What has been written, if you may, of that same in analysis, that then is conveyed to two people that are in their final phase of their analysis. Those people are passers. Lacan uh, speaks in a very similar way, the, and the function of the passer is to transmit desire in a way that it is their own invention somehow, in a way that it is not the testimony alone. It's not just that. There is something else there that hopefully will pass to this group. It's very much uh, interested in that figure. And keeping the problem. Yeah, I think that's important. Yes. Otherwise, um, we don't have, uh, we can only have a, a task if we have a problem. Question. Yeah, could you explain a little bit the, the space of the breakage, of the backbone, or the space in the crack that the saxophage moves through and breaking through the rock? Because you said that it was the proper place of the poet. Is it also the proper place of the philosopher? And what is that space, um, maybe in the other time? I think the uh, Agamben said it, wrote it. This is in Heidegger. And <clears throat> to I think that the concept the concept that we could use here is the concept of uh, loss or lack lack perhaps I think Herman you will talk about that later so, of multiple of um, perhaps the void in mathematics. No, the I would produce more images like the shadows and something more images, but what they. My humble gift to America is immanence and multiplicity. That is what I've come to bring. And what I've taken is that I have to give proof of the freshness of your questions and your enthusiasm and your appetite. Appetite needs a gap. My what I want is to encourage you to step on the, the problems and to embrace when something that you may read or listen to or want to do or write in that sense is heterogeneous. And 
to invite you to think in a, in a way that there is no guarantee. There is nothing behind to provide consistency to the human condition. But that doesn't make it worthless because that breakage, that gap, can become a cause for desire. As Gabriel, he was in, in, I think, this building talking, was here or in the forum? Uh, no, not in this building, no. All right. He was at the church, the FDA. All right. Yeah. He's a professor in Buenos Aires. He talks about liberty in psychoanalysis, Lombardi. And he says something that I read recently and that I like. The fact that we are, that we have an end, in the sense that a limit, we are touched by death, makes us pathetic to occupy that breakage, that gap, can produce the effect that we call desire. Any more questions? One more question we, we have to... Um, you use <coughs> imminence, multiplicity, and gap yep. in defining this. And so that just, for me, elicited um, consideration of other thinkers. When you say those things, is, is it helpful or detrimental to think of Deleuze and of Lacan's use of the gap? Is that precisely what we're talking about? Yeah. Philosophically, perhaps, more than psychoanalytically, but... We are all concerned about human condition and thought. I think. And um, in Spinoza, it's really difficult to th find a way of thinking desire, especially in a Lacanian way, because in Spinoza, Spinoza is a philosopher of the real, nothing is missing there. Perhaps we can think desire more as a as a movement or is that the type, but it's a hard way. But what is nice of that is that I don't need to reconcile Lacan, Spinoza, Deleuze, and Badiou to produce an effect out of them. They are just different. And perhaps that makes this world even more beautiful, just because they are different. Um, those are also my friends. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, we're going to.